All right. Uh, how come you left the church? Well, in those days, Scientology was a happy place. When I first did the concourse, people were welcoming, they were friendly, communication was free-flowing, you could pretty much say anything you wanted, you could talk tech, you could talk about your case, nobody bothered you about anything, you didn't get any gag orders, you weren't told, you must not say this, you must not say that. If you disagreed with something, you could say you disagreed. It was a wide-open, friendly, um, comfortable environment. And I got used to that. That was my first... Um, experience in the Church of Scientology. So to me, the church was a, a wonderful place to be. It was alive, and it was um, productive. There were a lot of people, and I had a lot of friends. We had parties. We had, you know, they have these rules now about joking and degrading. We used to joke all the time about everything, including the tech. And we had parties, we'd make up songs about ARC and the dynamics, and I was a performer, so I was always dancing and singing. We just had a great time, parties and everything. So um, then I watched, I watched it change in the 60s, and it became more and more quieted down. People were becoming a little suppressed. People were, become, were told you could be declared, you could, you know, ethics came out. Who knows what that, I mean, why that was called ethics. I mean, people were just in fear. Um, the way it was applied was not very ethical. Eth ethics was not applied ethically. From my observation and opinion, I felt it, it created an atmosphere of fear rather than happiness and friendliness. Um, ARC went down. Control went up. You're supposed to raise ARC along with control. They're supposed to be equal, not control up here and ARC down here. That's not Scientology. So I saw that the subject, the Church of Scientology, was getting away from the subject that I loved so much that got me to come in. And then I went to St. Hill. St. Hill was a great place. It was still friendly. It was still, even though there was some of this uh, PTS and SP declares going on, that was minimal, and there was much more camaraderie and fun and good times at St. Hill. And I did the whole briefing course, and then I did the Class 7 um, power auditor internship, training and internship. Was and it many people on course at the time? Oh, there was, I'm sure, maybe 100 or 200 people there. I mean, it was very crowded. It was over six. I was there, again, for six months to get that training. Um, so there were a lot of people. I made so many good friends there. There must have been at least 100 people, and probably more. At, at that time? At that time, in the late 60s, mm -hmm. 67 to 68. And then in 68, I went to Edinburgh, and I got um, on my upper level OT levels, all the way up to, at that time, original OT6. And... Um, I got the. I said to the Qualsec at Edinburgh at the AO. I said, "I've reached the top of the subject. I'm at um, level six, level seven. I'm a level seven auditor. I'm a, I'm an interned power auditor, and I'm OT six. So I've hit the ceiling here. What's next? I need my next level of training. Because to me, training always came first. Training was where it was at. Auditing was like a." Um, um, a privilege or a, um, it was like dessert, you know, after you got your training, you got to co-audit with someone, or you got an intensive, and it was, auditing was a special benefit that you got, of course, to, for your own personal subjective reality, but the training was a real emphasis of what we were doing, because that was the tool that we were going to use to bring about a sane environment um, in this world, so that was very important to me. And I needed my next level of training. And I said to the Qualsec, I have to get the Class 8 course. But there was no Class 8 course. But you see, I was OT6 at that time, and I really was. I had done OT drills, just fresh OT drills that I had just done. And I was very exterior. And everything I wished for kind of came true. So that night that I told the Qualsec, I need my next level of training. I need the Class A course. He says, well, there is no Class A course. That night, I get the phone call from the New York org that I should go to the ship for the Class A course. 
<laughs> taught by L. Ron Hubbard. And that was the way my postulates were working. So I went through lines and through all sorts of routing forms and ended up on the ship in Greece, in Corfu, where L. Ron Hubbard taught us the Class 8 materials and CSing and auditing. And I did that whole thing. And then I went to the New York Org, and I was the CS there. And so was my husband at the time, who probably wouldn't want me to mention his name, but I'm going to anyway, Artie Merritt. Now he's going to have to get some sort of ethic cycle done on him because somebody out of the church mentioned his name. Okay. All right. Uh, since you mentioned the ethics, and uh, <clears throat> I, I want to ask, because this is your thing as a, as a belief, right? It's something that you're very passionate for and with, with your helping uh, people with. Yes. So can, can you... I developed ethics in the field. A few of us were working on that at the time. There were several people in the church that were working on ethics in the field because ethics in the org was so scary and it was, it was uncomfortable and it was um, out of ARC and people were... There were some... I can't put everybody... There were some people in HCO who knew how to use the ARC triangle and had some tech training, which of course was policy. Every ethics officer was supposed to be a trained auditor, but that policy was hardly ever enforced. So you had out comm cycles, out TRs, out no ARC, poor control, uh, military style control because they were in the Sea Org. Uh, it was just all snarled up. So the ethics conditions didn't have the benefit that they actually intrinsically contain uh, because of all this added inapplicable stuff that was going on around, around the way it was being applied. And it was being applied third dynamically in a way that was um, very um, sort of suppressive. I mean, people were, auditors were put in dungeons and fed on bread and water at the AO. And I, I could tell you some terrible stories, but I think I'll keep the tone level above two here. But <laughs> anyway, um, I decided, along with some friends, that doing ethics should be a, a comfortable and good adventure for the person. It should be something that they could learn from and grow from, not something that would make them cringe and give them true indications, find out their real condition, help them confront the condition, and be on their side. Work with them. So it's you and me working together to get your ethics in so that you can have a life that you want um, that's beneficial and that's expansive. And instead of, your ethics are out, you have to do a low condition. I mean, that kind of thing wasn't working. So... I worked and worked more and more with my friends, and we together pooled our resources and abilities, and we worked out very in-depth applications of treason, enemy, doubt, you know, these very low conditions that, were, that sounded so uh, uncomfortable to acknowledge that you, might be, that you might have something to do with that, and we made it okay. We made it safe. And then the more I did it, I continued. Some of my friends stopped doing that. Some of them continued. But the more I worked with it, the more success I had. And then I learned from the people I worked with how these conditions applied in, in more and more ways. And I used all my technical training to make the conditions and the formulas work even better. And everything I learned from L. Ron Hubbard, and I poured it into these applications of ethics. And... It just went out the roof, and my phone wouldn't stop ringing, and people wanted it. They wanted it. They wanted it. So um, I decided, well, what I need to do is train some people on how to do this, and so I did. I took my Class 8 colleagues and Class 6s, and I hatted them up on doing the ethics the way I did it because it was successful, and they wanted to learn, and some of them had sort of given up on even auditing. Because some of these problems with the organization were um, discouraging, you know. Um, and they got revitalized to be able to help people and get them back on lines. And then I had some trouble with the orgs for um, doing ethics in the field. It became sort of known as the super-duper Mary Marin squirrel ethics rundown or something. And, and yet, my statistic was number of people back on lines onto their next service. 
So there wasn't too much they could do to stop me because everybody was winning. The person got back onto their purpose of moving up the bridge. The orgs got their public back. I got an FSM commission. The people that I trained got people back on lines, and the people I trained got their FSM commissions. So there was no sort of tr crack to fall through. Even though there were investigations, they couldn't really stop it because the stats were up, up, up all the time. So that was a really winning time for me and my friends and colleagues in Los Angeles is where this was done. Okay.